welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 1014th new social environment. I'm Chloe Stagaman, Director of Programs here at The Rail, and I have the enormous pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Ghost of a Dream, Lauren Waz and Adam Ekstrom, and Julie Reese. And now I'll introduce today's guests and host. Ghost of a Dream is the collaborative project of Lauren Waz and Adam Ekstrom. Founded in 2008, Ghost of a Dream's work has been shown in solo exhibitions at Mass Art Art Museum, Ackland Art Museum, and many others, as well as in various group exhibitions. They received the first annual Young Masters Art Prize in London and have participated in artist residencies in Berlin, Basel, Beijing, France, and venues across the United States. They will attend the Rauschenberg Foundation Artist in Residency Program in 2025. And our host today, Julie Reese, is an independent scholar with a focus on contemporary art that addresses the climate crisis and the role artists play in social change. She's the editor of Art, Theory, and Practice in the Anthropocene. She is also the author of From Margin to Center, The Spaces of Installation Art. Julie teaches courses on art and sustainability, is a visiting critic at Columbia University, and we are so, so lucky to have Julie as a contributor to the Brooklyn Rail. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Julie to get us started. Thank you, Chloe. And thank you to Fong and The Rail for uh, being the platform that uh, Lauren and Adam and I can talk this afternoon about uh, a body of work that really has intrigued me and that I'm really glad I can bring to, uh, to this audience. Um, I became aware of Adam and Lauren's work. They have an exhibition right now uh, I know a place where they perform miracles at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Arlington. And that we're gonna look at that work, uh, which I think is really exciting new work and contributes a lot to artistic responses to the climate crisis and the field of wasteland photography. But before we get started doing that, I wanted to go back in time a little bit and kind of see where Adam and Lauren have been coming from. And um, we're gonna take a look at some earlier work, um, and I'm going to just, you know, put some, some questions and thoughts out there. Uh, Adam and Lauren, can you first start out by just telling us how did you start working together? We us um, a little bit about your collaborative process. We yeah. started because we lived in a loft together, and uh, I was making paintings, Lauren was making sculptures, wall down the middle, and then I, I was making paintings about her sculptures, and she was making sculptures about my paintings. So, so every every night um, we would go out and walk our dog Banana, and um, we were living in Ridgewood before Ridgewood was was happening, <laughs> and um, and we would find lottery tickets all over the ground. And we started picking them up and collaborating or thinking about them and thinking about like all the people who have touched them and what they wanted when they when they were playing, what they were hoping for. And so what you're looking at is almost our first project yeah. where we decided to take all these tickets and take mm -hmm. enough of them that it would cost to buy this most ridiculous car, which is the the most frequent thing people buy when they win the lottery. Um, so this is a Hummer H3 made in actual to scale. We went to the Hummer dealership many times and took rubbings on cars and measurements. And we worked with um, some students at RISD to, to build it as part of a, a class called Artist Projects. And um, and this is where we, we got our name as well. Like this, this giant shell of this, this dream car. If you look through the grill and the image in the lower left, um, you can see through that it's just, you know, just a shell made of cardboard. And so we decided to call out this piece ghost of a dream and then through the advice of many people, we decided as a collaborative, we should choose a name. And yeah. Be good or bad. I don't know yeah. what the face is good that, or bad advice. And that name, <laughs> like through getting that name, we decided that would like set a parameter of rules for when we work together. Like we we would decided we would, whenever we work together, we would make work about people's hopes and dreams out of the ephemera they create trying to attain those things. And so that's, I mean, that's led us for a really interesting practice because we, every time we change material, our, what our, pro, our production or what we make is very different. 
Um, we get to the so. next slide while you're talking. I, this is great, but let's just let, let's move to the the next one so you can, you can see where this goes. Yeah. Oh yeah. So we did. So the the projects were the top three things that people bought when they won the lottery, which was um, a dream car, a dream vacation, and a dream home. And so the dream vacation was made actually for the Deitch Parade, um, and we were supposed to be pulling this down. Through Broadway, through down Broadway, and Adam was going to be in a little speedo sitting on the chair. One of us is going to be in a speedo. <laughs> and um, and then uh, appropriately, a hurricane uh, came and canceled the parade. So <laughs> now it's now it's in Belgium, living in a collector's uh, house. <laughs> and, I think it's very interesting because you know the if we just go back to the little island for a moment, you know I. Is there an element of irony or absurdity in thinking that this is like the apex of what people would want if they could have it? I mean, this reminds me of this little plastic island I had in my turtle tank when I was a kid. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's just you're like... being fed some idea of what's the good life and you're supposed to want that. I mean, these things that are wanted, you know, I just, I don't, I'm not thinking that there's any judgment behind it, but is there an element of irony in, uh, having empathy for this longing, but also seeing it as a little bit absurd. For sure. We went into casinos and uh, recorded the sounds coming out of the slot machines and then took that recording and with uh, the help of a DJ, mixed it into a music that you would hear at like an all-inclusive resort to kind of point out how absurd that. Yeah. I mean, look we all do yeah i don't know i we we hate to be like judgmental about about yeah, any of sure. it and to us there's like a there's a draw to the lottery and to like this idea of of quick money um that we all have and sort of hope for and whether your dream is a dream vacation or not you know we yeah it was sort of like a easy way to play for us can we get the next one probably the next slide And this is you, you managed to source these and, and this I think anticipates some of your later work. Uh, the process of sorting them beyond you guys going through the dumpster at 7-Eleven or picking these up in Ridgewood. As the project expanded, how did you get all these tickets and cards? Same way. <laughs> Same way. But for the for the dream home, we were um, living in Basel, a residency, um, and we were living at the uh, on the grounds of the Foundation Byler. Which happens to be at the where France, Germany, and Switzerland all come together. So we would take bike rides and had bodegas helping us collect in all three of those countries. And so we would take bike rides every day and collect the losing tickets from from each of those places. And trying to explain that to um to these people running the stores in in German and French was always challenging. <laughs> but that um, definitely you know expands this idea that. This is a, if not an entirely collective experience, but in some parts of the world, it certainly is a collective experience. Um, yeah. and so this idea of the afterlife of things that are discarded, what do you think sort of drove you to working that way? Because you would go on to continue that. Let's actually have the, the next one, please. The next image. Um, you know, that you sort of, you go from, from that to, uh, things that people long to have, people's hopes and dreams. And then I feel like you, you go sort of take a little bit of a turn toward looking more critically at things discarded. And I just wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, me. so this so this project is um, is all made from catalogs uh, from Mass Arts, uh, 30 years of, of galleries. And that's this project sort of stemmed out of another project um, based on artist postcards. And for us, the artist postcard was was our version of a lottery ticket, you know, where, where you would get all these postcards printed and you would hand them out to everyone you knew, hoping that that would lead you to the next better thing, the next better gallery, the, the next better write up and all of that. And, and then in the end, you're left with stacks of these postcards and, you know, destined for the trash or your archives or whatever they were. Um, all the while we think we're better because it's an artist postcard but really we're drawing a pretty direct analogy to the gamble yeah 
Um, and so I think in this project was was less for the for mass arts um, for mass arts lobby. We were, we were less critical. We were just we really wanted to present sort of the history of these of these um, of what had happened in these galleries, um, you know, through our lens, I guess. Is that correct? What yeah, saying? this was uh, definitely honoring the previous 30 years mm -hmm. and trying to bring all this artwork together in one piece. Mm -hmm. You weren't already thinking about the uh, ephemera and detritus that's just created or left behind by, by the art world. So this is really more, I love this idea that this is also about the hopes and dreams that that this type of very specific ephemera uh, might have had for people, um, a type of lottery ticket in itself. Um, but let's go to the next one. Let's let's see where this this kind of this goes to. <laughs> so what happens here? So for uh, several years, Laura and I made our money art handling at art fairs. And every time we would enter art fair, you know, at the end, put, taking it down, we'd walk around and the way art fair operates quite often a gallery sends many artworks in one crate they sell the artworks to many collectors it has to be separated and go to different places so those crates end up being refuse um and so does the packing tape and any number of things the carpet that's on a convention center floor so every time we walked around we we would talk about you know this and and eventually we were like oh, we could we could build a house out of this scrap every single time there's a fair yeah um, I, I think at first we were like ooh free materials yes that was the first thing <laughs> and we were just running around like like kids in a candy store excited about all the free stuff we could bring home but then um, we still use all the packing materials that we collected then <laughs> um, but then you know it started getting really disgusting and seeing how at the end of miami they would just take all those crates in the middle of the parking lot and just like ram them with um you know big what are those things called? Yeah, with forklifts Forklift. there's there's a day where uh, a bunch of people that work for the union gather all the crates after everybody leaves me at miami and they have kind of like a demolition day where they have fun just crushing all these crates um for the, the piece, this is the piece we made with the detritus where we just took the materials and brought it back into an art fair. So it was the, 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 those paintings are made on the back of crate lids. And then there's carpet glued to that, which is from the art fair floor. And then we, we painted these designs and the idea is the designs really oppy and hard to look at. And we wanted to overhang the booth, which is kind of, you know, uh, what some people do at an art fair because everybody pays a lot of money to get these booths and quite often a lot of work goes on the wall and we want and we wanted to replicate the whole art fair experience by by putting in as much information and make it as busy as possible in the booth and then from there we made an actual house yeah so maybe next slide would be good So, so this was shown at Smack Melon, and and so we we did what we thought we could do, <laughs> and this is now in our backyard and, and operates as a little guest house. But um, it's made entirely out of um, crates. Uh, the door and windows are made. The windows are made from swag bags from John Baldessari at the UBS Lounge. Um, the bed inside is made out of crate foam. Um, and every piece of it is is uh yeah collected material from the art fairs. I mean, the way it, it's kind of it's wonderful because we we talk so much about a closed loop, right? So this becomes a kind of endlessly closed loop because you could demolish this at the end of the art fair and you could make it into something else. So it it absolutely um it captures something also of the hopelessness of, of a closed loop. It, it never goes away, right? You're still gonna have the, the material. And mm -hmm. one of the things I really like about this is I feel like as art handlers, you have this perspective that you know, most people are not gonna see. This is all generally invisible to people who visit an art fair. And if, if they are thinking about anything, and I, I you know, would want to do a shout out to the good work that the Gallery Climate Coalition is doing right now to raise awareness of excessive travel, uh, the harm to the environment of certain ways of shipping artwork. Uh, but this is literally the stuff 
of the of the art fair. And I feel like that's a really important thing to get into the conversation. And it it feeds into the uh, the work you're going to be doing a little bit later that has to do with this accumulation that's generally out of sight and trying to make that visible. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this is, I mean, I've, I've been inside this little house, so I, I can attest you could live in this house. I mean, this <laughs> is actual material that can be used uh, in building. Uh, let's go to the next slide because we can-, can I just say one more thing later. about, about well, I guess this, I can say it on this page too, but, um, you know, I feel I feel like while this was critical of of art fairs, we also were going back and forth because we, we were making all of our money through them, through both sales and through um, through having a job. So, you know, I don't I think that it's problematic, but it's also necessary a lot of times. You know, it's a necessary evil, so we just have to consider how we go about it yeah. now, right? More than you know, we have to think about what we send, how it's sent, mm -hmm. you know, how can we send it better? How could we, you know, waste less when we do it? Yeah. Um, you want to talk about this? Sure. So this, or were you going to speak about this first, Julie? No, I'm going to let you do that because I think it's a really interesting concept uh, because this is where you tie into the title of the work uh, about fair housing. It's not only art fair and housing, but it has a larger meaning. So why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, so we we put the art fair house uh, next to a pond, right? And we wanted we actually originally wanted to film it falling through the water. It was all connected to cables, so we could pull it out. We got scuba gear to mm -hmm. to make sure we didn't leave anything in this this friend's lake. Um, but every time we tried to pull it onto the lake, the lake broke because of the lakes don't freeze up here anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years prior, we could have easily done that. So that's a side note. But the um, the other portion of this artwork as we surrounded it with cameras, which are also built from crate um, parts, um, put the security cameras on it, filmed it. And we filmed it over the course of a month. And then we made a film where the house is sitting there. It goes into fog. Um, so filming fog coming in and going away. We removed the house um, and then kept filming. So when you're sitting in the gallery from the same vantage point, you, you watch a, a half an hour film that um, where you see this house, you see fog roll in, and then or the smoke, and then the smoke clears, right? And the house is gone, like the the bubble has burst, like it's gone. <laughs> so uh, we we're comparing the 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 idea of art art in the art market with what was happening at the time with the housing market. That there are these bubbles that come and and go, and just sort of the the problems that that happen because of that. No, I think it adds a, a, a whole different level and actually begins to uh, broaden out your uh, your concerns, uh, which we'll we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, so I just I'm I'm interested though. You know, we start out with this idea of uh, things that people are longing for, and your focus on that sort of that collective longing. And do you is that still what's sort of driving? Uh, this type of work it's now not just the longing for a dream house but the longing for for housing i mean is, is it uh, is that what's what's is it how do that how do you connect those things <laughs> you i mean well in in 2016 we had a kid which changed our concerns all all together right now we're mm -hmm. Now, you know, that's that's kind of when in, in 2015 and 16, we had a kid, the administration changed a whole number of things in our in our world and our collective world changed. And so our concerns switched from uh, hopes of love and money, desire these things to more social and and environmental concerns of uh, what's what's the future of our daughter going to look like what's the future of our country going to look like what's the future of the world if we don't treat it correctly like what you know all these problems um were, were already there but all of a sudden they were much more clear to yeah, us yeah and... all of a sudden it was yeah there was a very you know, a huge shift in our in our country with left versus right and mm -hmm. and everything became everything became so political that we just needed to start addressing that within our artwork. Well, I think 2016 is uh, it's a watershed year in so many ways, but it is also 
in the within the art world a time where I think um, many people share your feelings that they the art had to somehow address more uh, things that were going on. And it's really interesting to see that shift in your work. Let's stop just a moment at the next slide because I would like, I mean, do you want to talk about the, the, the posters or should we go to the DACA work? Um, we can briefly say something about okay. the posters. Okay. So, which... <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit about in relation to what you were saying about the vacation piece and this I ideal of a vacation, right? And so these expound from that a little bit, right? And we're thinking about what is a vacation. Uh, it's both what is a vacation, and we all come home from vacation and we need a vacation for our vacation. But number two, um, these vacation places, these these oases are I don't know, perfect places we are kind of destroying. It's 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 a little bit analogous to the show that's up in Arlington as well. Yeah. And I think that that we we ended up finding we <laughs> we ended up finding these travel posters in thrift stores. Um whenever we were in a new place, we were always sort of looking for for these uh after we came across them in, once in Italy in a in a thrift store. And um and started thinking about what happens when you cut away? What happens, you know, could you ever see that vantage point um, for real without tourists around, without, you know, all this other, all these other things clouding it. So we started cutting into these travel-based posters um, and, and just seeing what happened, you know, how that reframed, reframed the message. Well, I, I think that that actually also just feeds into the, uh, the imaginary that we have and our lack of ability often to connect the reality of uh, our actions and the results of our actions with our fantasy that these places are going to always be there for us and we're going to be able to aspire to one day um, take selfies of ourselves in, in, in front of them. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, I I like the uh, that as a, a transition. Um, and I understand also that the birth of a child could reorient you entirely to wondering <laughs> what are they going to be able to see and what's going to be there for them and that sense of responsibility. Um, so it becomes less playful. Uh, and I think that that, that takes us actually to, uh, to this one, uh, which I think is really great precursor to uh, your uh, more well-known work, Aligned by the Sun. But why don't you tell us about this one? Um, well, I guess t starting with the idea of the sun, it always really interested us, this idea of the sunset being like the beginning, beginning of the day, or the end of the day, the beginning of the night, this, this idea of the magic hour, this idea of like, sort of everything being okay when you're in this golden light. Um, it's both that, this time of change, right? But it's also this object that we all view and it's it's kind of our life blood it, like all, everybody on this planet it's all it's this one object that we all need and we all see and so you know coming from uh hearing all of the promises that obama made it about about daca um the deferred action um program uh we and Trump came along and was said he's going to just terminate, terminate it instantly. Um, and so we got really scared about what all these people who had come into this country as children um, were all going to have to to leave. And we got scared about what that was going to mean to everyone. And so for this project, we took um, there's about 30 countries who have a thousand or more DACA uh, people that receive the DACA uh, requirements so that they could work legally in the U.S. And we took uh, a sunset from each of those countries and just aligned it by that center point of the sun and let all of the edges sort of be visible as it faded out. As is, a that the first time that, is that the first time that you worked in that, that way of overlaying photographs to uh, align by something? Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> Within a few months, we yeah. made a few pieces together aligning them by the sun. And I'm just curious, how did you source these photographs? Were, were these just uh, sourced, crowdsourced, internet sourced? They were completely internet sourced. Um, at the time, that's that's what we thought we could do, right? 
Um, and then as we moved forward to a piece we'll talk about later, A Line by the Sun, um, we started reaching out to people to get the actual footage from, from people in their home countries, home nations. Now we're going to take a look at some stills from that video in a little bit. Um, but now, um, and that that is one of the centerpieces of uh, Ghosts of the Dreams exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Arlington. Uh, and what we're going to do now is turn to uh, the other works that are in that exhibition, um, which in all in different ways address different in aspects of the environmental crisis, the human cause uh, impact human impacts on the environment. Um, and this is a series, as uh, we will see, of uh, photographs forced from the internet uh, and overlaid uh, to create images such as you see here. Um, and I'd like to just talk a little bit about them. Uh, I have some questions about them. I, I'd like to hear how you uh, develop this idea and this process, and we'll just talk about them a little bit. So mm -hmm. how did you, let's, for starters, um, how did you decide to to make this series what, and, and to do it this way? Coming out of the uh, DACA work, uh, we made a similar work about um, uh, Trump's travel ban. Um, like coming out of that work, we started thinking about all, all sorts of things that were concerning us and just started making collections of images of news stories um, that were concerning us, putting it, kind of collecting and filing them in folders. It's how we make all our work, right? We, even when we're making collages, we're taking multiples of this material and putting it together. Um, so even though this is drastically visually different than uh, the physical collages, we're thinking of it the same way, like the importance that goes into our materials when we're making a collage, like that fact that so many people have held a lottery um, or a exhibition catalog, that like energy that goes into it, we see the same energy now going into um, digital images, like so many people see this news story and what what what's going through their head when they're viewing this story are they just dismissing it is it going by in their news feed are they spending time with it you know and started thinking about the multiple of this image and like is hopefully when you you overlay them we see this repeat that that happens and and maybe we call a little more attention to it is that yeah I... yeah so so we have a million different folders on our desktop. And every time we would notice a, an image, we would sort of dump it into this, you know, just take a screen grab and dump it into the folder. And then started to think of them as, as sort of a portraiture of, uh, a portraiture of fire, a portraiture of coral, a portraiture of, of flooding, all these different, uh, all these different things. And so we thought if we put everything together, um layer make these layered images that are like sort of hard you know you sort of want to like part the curtain and, and try to get through that it would call attention that we've seen these images so many times the same sort of images so many times what does that mean and how will it change to see them sort of stacked up can we get the uh we'll just go to the next one so people can see uh, another one i know when uh, in your process uh, you have a range of how many images get overlaid. Um, what is, is there a point where you feel that like a sweet spot, legibility, illegibility? How do you know when you got there? <laughs> Not this way. No, you go ahead. Uh, I, I mean, for us, I think it's about, uh, it hits a point where it becomes too muddy, right? And then we have to pull back. Like it, it, whenever we're making a, a, a a, a digital collage or a physical collage, there's always a point where we start tearing the paper off the panel or taking um, on this like airplanes, uh, putting out fires, we take them away. There's, you know, how many are in this piece? Um, so this one has 28 pieces, right? But it probably started with 45. And like we, we, we just start taking them away until it, it makes sense as an image. You can't tell on, online here, but when you get up close, you can read probably all 28 planes. It's just, you get little pieces of information. And once we st start to go too far, you can't read anymore. And it, it becomes too muddy that it kind of blocks 
blocks the read, I think. Mm -hmm. And are, th are these are not uh, individuals, Pinterest pictures that they put up. These were all initially in some kind of journalistic format. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. For, yeah. From major news sources, you know, I guess ac across many different countries, but I think these the plain ones, I think were focused mostly in the US. Um, you know, we had several summers of, of really feeling the effects of, of fires and what would happen, you know, here last summer, just having all of that smoke come down and what, what that meant, um, you know, when, even when you can't see the fire, how it changed uh, our behavior. And so I think that's why we really started thinking about the fire. I was thinking, uh, this, you know, sadly, there's a lot of, of photography of, uh, you know, waste, wasteland photography. And generally, you know, thinking, say, of someone like uh, Edward Bertinsky's images of some of these same subjects, uh, like pit mines or uh, areas that have been clear cut, um, they're geographically specific. It will tell you, like, this is a, mine, a coal strip mine in Montana, or this is deforestation in Cambodia. And I, I just would like us to think together a little bit about is anything lost by the lack of geographical specificity? Um, is, it, is the, the point is that this is happening everywhere all the time, all at once. Uh, but I also just wonder uh, in terms of, you know, what, what we can learn from it. Um, do you ever think that maybe uh, you need that, that list of where all those places are? Yeah, we've gone back and forth about that. Um, I think the argument for is that, I mean, the argument against, sorry, is that we're all connected in this, where if this is happening in California or if this is happening in India, it's affecting us everywhere. So that's our argument for just, for not having lists of places. And, and on top of that, it's, it's not affecting us if we're at the fire or not at the fire you know it doesn't matter if it's at the antipode right if it's in australia it's still affecting us here right mm -hmm. or if there's a fire in new york it's still affecting people in australia like it's it's all interconnected so we we did toy with like listing you know 28 places but then you know which i'm a huge fan of long titles so that would be <laughs> kind of cool but it it didn't make sense to us to 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 do that yeah i guess for this I don't, and, and it'd be interesting to think hear what you what you thought too but for us we at the moment we were thinking that to sort of drive home the fact that this is universal and wherever you are it's affecting you was our and it's also why we're like you're talking about the geography of the titles correct yes and um that's we're choosing music titles um, and, Let's go uh, back to that last one, so we can we can look at a title while we talk about it. Can we go back one? Are you, yeah. I mean, quite often it's it's really popular music or music we love and that are it's really important to us. Um, this title of the 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 show and this piece, I know a place where they perform miracles, um, came about when we were seeing clap your hands and say yeah, and we're at the top of a mountain last summer and all around us was a, a a super storm something we all of a sudden are seeing way more than we ever have before right and so we were surrounded by a super storm but they kept lightning everywhere yeah and they kept terrifying. playing and, and this song happened and we turned to each other and we're like we gotta name the show this because it was just this type of storm we don't see very or didn't used to see frequently this this fantastic poetic title Mm -hmm. And for us, the the idea of um, the titles using a using a line from a pop song can sort of transport you into that song and sort of give a a soundtrack, if you will, to to the image. You know, so whenever I see this, I start humming the song, and to me, that you know, it, songs have such a unique ability of bringing you to a specific time and place. Um, and so, whether you know the song or not, like. 
to us doesn't necessarily matter, but it's it's more like, I don't know, it gives us some sort of a timing and place to, to place it in. I mean, they're also, to me, I actually don't know this song, but to me, this title um, also just feels ironic. Like there ain't gonna be no miracle. Right, yeah. So I, I feel like, uh, again, that, that goes toward this, uh, I, sort of slight angle toward a little bit of humor and the absurd, which I actually really like if I think about the titles that way, uh, because that's something that art can do, right? You need a little bit of irony there. You know, the, the media stories, uh, one would argue, have not been effectual, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. matter how many of them go by, we still have what's going on here. Uh, and I think to sort of freeze that and freeze this sense of there could be another one and another one and another one. And even as we're talking, they're just, the internet is just filling up with them. Uh, the titles can sort of slow that down and, and make it um, a little bit like, this is, this is crazy, you know? And I, I feel like the, the lines that you choose, um, you know, I particularly like the, the one for the, um, for the iceberg, you know, just yesterday morning, they let me know you were gone. I'm like, where have you been? You know, <laughs> I think there's something funny about them. I don't know if it's your intention or it, it just kind of, um, I think. Yeah, so. I think humor yeah. is important. Like if we're too heavy handed, I mean, that's that's how we are kind of deset. It's the importance of not being heavy handed or being too blunt, right? But you have to ride that fine line. We're still talking about something without being too heavy handed. Um, but that's that's exactly right. And I think, you know, there's been plenty of studies as people look more and more about uh, the role of, of art and other, the arts in general uh, at this moment, um, you know, people seem to recoil if something seems uh, primarily didactic. Mm -hmm. uh, and people seem to, you know, prefer uh, if something seems like it's, you know, they call it the awesome solution, right? Uh, can mm -hmm. activists art change the way people think? Right, this you know, people have really tried to quantify this in the social sciences, um, mm -hmm. and certainly one of the uh, conclusions is that uh, people don't like to uh, be overwhelmed and they don't like to feel depressed. But okay, there's going you're going to need a little bit of that. But my feeling about your work, and it's one of the things that that drew me to it, is that you find a good sweet spot. Uh, you have the understanding of something that's overwhelming because obviously there's an unlimited number of these images and they just keep coming and this is happening everywhere. Um, but at the same time, um, you're, you're, it's, it's sort of like you're holding up a mirror. You aren't telling people uh, what, what to think, right? You're transforming something into an artwork so that you can kind of deal with it more, right? It doesn't, it's a small piece of something very big, but that small piece is maybe something we can deal with more than trying to wrap our minds around the entire problem. And I think that's something that art can do. And I think it's something that uh, your art for me successfully does. So uh, I would continue with the no, uh, the no geography. Um, <laughs> but it is interesting, you know, in light of, um, uh, aligned by the sun, which we'll get to in a moment. Why don't we just run through um, the rest of, of these before, and then before we get to align with the sun. So let's go to the next one. All right, so this is the whole effect of the uh, of the exhibition. Um, and oh, I wanted to just take a moment uh, for you to, to talk a little bit about your choice to use dye bond. Sure, it's, oh, go ahead. Um, well, you know, we had so much in the past, like really uh, put a focus on collecting materials and and that idea of the the watched and used. Um, so for us, printing was a new thing. And when we started looking at different printing options, we found that dye bond was was mainly recycled materials. And so that's I guess are the main yeah. reason. What dye bond is, is a, a real thin sheet of aluminum. And then inside is a, a plastic core of recycled plastic. And then the, again, on the back, another sh thin sheet of aluminum. So it was a, mostly about the, the fact of being recycled. Um, whenever we've made a screen print recently, like we've been asked to make some screen print editions. Originally, sometime back, we said no, because we couldn't think about how, how that would make sense. And 
after thinking about it, we started making our screen prints on uh, the backside of, you know, off prints or whatever from other artists. So, so that's, you know, recycling that material. Um, Daibon was the answer for us there. It also is an incredibly, uh, just, it's just a great surface, right? It's like yeah. these almost end up feeling like signs. Mm -hmm. It has that, um, that kind of cool, uh, that cool surface. It um, also allows the image to, to float, literally. You know, you're floating it off the wall. It's strong enough, you know, it, it stays flat. It, it doesn't need a frame, so you don't have the waste of a frame. And it... it well, I think, it, I think it, it, uh, it, it works really well with these. I think the other thing that that uh, I think about when I I look at these is uh, the idea of habituation, right? That if something just is and we keep seeing it over and over again, whatever it is just starts to seem normal, like that's the way it is, right? And I feel like this uh, you can become habituated to all kinds of horrible things if they just after a while there's a kind of numbness, and I feel like these this series of images comments on that feeling of numbness. It is about the way we see and process these images. A little mm -hmm. bit blurry, a little bit fuzzy. We've never, many of us have never been there. We're, we're not uh, necessarily the local communities who are living directly with these atrocities and see them every day. Uh, for uh, many people in the part of the world that's responsible for the, uh, actions that cause these things, they're far away and they're remote. And mm -hmm. that sort of fuzzy, translucent veil that comes from all the layering that you do, it, for me, uh, makes visible that feeling that I can't quite picture it and I can't quite see it. So it's both things. It gives you a sense of how vast the problem is, how much and how many. And at the same time, it's you know, it's in a, in some fuzzy part of my imagination. I know there's a clothing mound, mm -hmm. and I I feel like that's something that uh, is very helpful. You know, photography, as you know, Susan Sontag, to paraphrase, tells us what crises and what catastrophes we're going to see. Right? It's going to tell us what we're going to look at. But I think the way the technique that you have developed for these also tells us our own experience as. Um, scrollers or internet users or just news consumers how they might appear to us in our own imagination so For sure. that's, that's not really a question it's just you know it's just <laughs> something that, that, that I've thought about and I, I don't know if you thought about it when you were working on these but as a viewer that's my experience on them yeah I mean we think about or sorry were you gonna... no go ahead uh, I mean, we think about it all the time, all these uh, atrocities that are affecting us and we're working with them and this disconnect and like, how do we resolve that disconnect that, you know, mm -hmm. you, we're talking about these issues and, you know, we're affected by those issues, but the, the actual thing isn't right in front of yeah. us. And how do you still, how do you still make all the right choices and, <laughs> um, and keep that, yeah, keep it, you know, in the forefront of your daily choice making. Um, so if, the, if, those early, the, if those early works were about people's dreams and longings, like would it be fair to say that these images are kind of like the, uh, they're like the, the impact, the cost to the planet of indulging in those things that people think they have to have in order to have a good life, right? That they're kind of two sides of the same coin. For sure. Drive that Hummer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know? um, I I mean, I guess thinking very literally, you, I love the idea of ghosts of a dream. Now, most of us are not dreaming about coral bleach. We don't, if we think about it, we'll be sad if we think about coral bleach. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way it's, it's um, the idea of ghosts of a dream takes on a little bit of a different meaning, a kind of melancholy about maybe, you know, things lost like if there was a, a dream yeah I mean I think it was always a little bit about things lost but um yeah I mean we're trying to whether or not we're successful we're trying to ride both sides right because we're yeah. talking about things lost what's happening if especially if we continue this way and what what we hope for we we, we hope this image we're looking at changes right we hope the news 
news stories we see are the regeneration of coral. You know, there's so many people out there trying it, but at the same time, there's so many people out there destroying it. So there are stories of corals that are coming back, right? Like through the immense effort of humans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the same time with the same or more immense effort where they're dying. So will we ever hit that, that fulcrum point where we can start to turn around and this image we're looking at right here of the repeated news story becomes a more alive piece of coral, right? Like I like to think both those dreams are in that same image. Yeah. You know? Oh, I, I love that. Um, let's turn to Align by the Sun, which is such a widely circulated project. Um, let's, why don't you just tell us a little bit about the genesis of this one and then we can uh, finish up by talking about it. So when we were working with those um, DACA sunsets, we started thinking about um, what hap what would happen if we could actually talk to these people. And so we began this project sort of out of that that thought. It was right when um, when COVID was hitting and we were sort of coming to the realization that we were going to be staying still and not not going anywhere for a while. And um, we were sort of, you know, we were very sad <laughs> about it all happening and what was going to happen to, you know, to everything around us. And so we decided that we didn't, we didn't want to stop all the conversations that we've been having in the art world um, over the years. So we wanted to start reaching out to people and, and, uh, and we, making some sort of project that would include more than just the two of us. Yeah. And we decided like what, you know, in 2020, you know, we're not yet talking. We're not yet yet the Zoom world, and we're we're alone in the studio. We're we're like we we have to do something. And what what would be the most inclusive piece we could make collaboratively? We like collaborating with people, like with conversations, and so we decided to reach out to. Um, we gave ourselves a rubric: a uh, one person to all the mem uh, an artist in each member state of the UN, right? Um, which is 193. And so we started reaching out to people um, and asking them to uh, film the sun at the end of the day for seven minutes in hopes to make this 24 hour film. Um, we now have all that footage. We haven't made the 24 hour film, but we've made a, a number of other things um, on the way to that. And so. And we chose the sun because again, like that idea of the sun being both the beginning and end, but it's also was the one thing that we all felt that I felt like everyone had access to. The sun, you know, we all look at that same sun as it travels around the, around the, um, the world or as. As the world, as the world travels, travels around, around the sun. Around. <laughs> and, See, I'm such a centrist. <laughs> but uh, a few things happened, right? Like our, our idea of nationhood changed, right? Because we now have um, artist participants from all 193 member states, but also over 30 other nations, you know, within the U.S. We have, you know, within the boundaries we call the U.S., there are over 600 nations, right? And other things like Somaliland or Crimea or, you know, this idea of... Disputed, disputed places of yeah. countryhood and who gets to decide where the border is and what is uh, deemed a country or not a country became became really apparent to us as we started making this, so... Which is why we keep working on it, too. We see it as an endless project, right? This The idea of nation and, and nations uh, go away, nations pop up. Um, this is a tangent from what yeah. we Anyway, this project. <laughs> in this no, I, I, think it's, I think it's very relevant. And I love the idea that you're just never going to be able to be done. You shouldn't be able to be done. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's um, it's ambitious. Um, I had a I had a couple of thoughts about it. One, I wanted to just mention to people who are listening that uh, this film is became part of um, the Little Sun films. So it's actually uh, that film project that uh, Olafur Eliasson has been working on. There's five films that are circulated very widely. Uh, people can look at them on YouTube. They can be used in school programs. So it's had a life outside of the art world, which I think is very interesting. Um, and I also, you know, this, if we can just talk about, it's been a little bit of controversy uh, about the film, uh, whether it's 
in some ways, uh, there's no cynicism here, right? And I don't want to say uh, naive, but there's a kind of innocence in saying we're all under the same sun in a world where so many people's experience of standing on this earth is so very different from other people's and so very unequal. And I, I wonder if we could just sort of unpack that a little bit. Um, sure. you know, is that something that um, is somehow obscured by uh, this video or is the video aspirational in some way? You know, and that's, I'd love to just hear your thoughts on that. So I think that when we were when we were trying to connect with people, um, it was really important for us to find an artist, um, just because as, as artists we wanted to connect with other artists, and finding an artist in you know some very far flung places, far from us, far from us could be could be difficult. Um, so the what am I trying to say? So there's a there's a that you know the who's in who's in the project is very different. Sometimes there's basket weavers and sometimes there's crafts people and sometimes there's um, blue chip gallery artists. Um, and to us that was really important. It's like showcasing who some of these people were um, and where they chose to represent their son. Um, and hope we're hoping, through, you know, every time that we show this piece, we have everybody's names listed. Can we and have that image, please, with all the names? Yeah, it's the next our, two images are, two images. are credits yeah. for all the uh, artist participants in in the uh, the film that's at the museum. The disparity of these places is enormous, right? I mean, e even access to internet is one little. Thing that we all have to deal with which mm -hmm. is huge right and some people had to mail hard drives some people had to walk you know hours to go to to a place with internet to send it other mm -hmm. people had to hit a button right and that and, just that disparity is yeah. huge and not some, to mention yeah like, somebody in sorry i was gonna say some some people too like would send you know a huge file and then other people would send like 10 second clips on whatsapp or something that they could get out um, somebody in in Haiti was saying they couldn't go outside because there was too much shooting. So, you know, eventually they filmed it out the window. Um, you know, the the disparity of relationships that came out of this was uh, immense. And um, I mean, that's that's really it. interesting and really moving. Um, somewhere, it would be really great, I think, to be able to uh, present something about that as part of the piece yeah I mean our hope is our hope is to have some sort of website where you'll be able to click on each of those per people's names and have um have it linked to some sort of story or or, or website of, um of that person and then also we want to do some sort of book that would would sort of talk about the journey of that project those are, I think those are those are great ideas and those, those would be really great companions uh, to anyone who hasn't actually experienced the video. The way it's shown in Arlington is um, it's slowed down and panoramic. So you can watch it just on a screen if you, you know, go look it up on YouTube. But uh, in Arlington, you can actually stand and be surrounded by it and get a sense of the sun uh, slowly moving uh, around. Um, there's very few human beings in it. I wonder when you put out the call for imagery, um, did you specifically not want people in there or did people just decided to focus on the sun? It's, it's pretty rare where there's humans. There are some hum like humans on beaches, um, but it's cars. cars. Going by and, yeah. Um, our only, our prompts, which a lot of people ignored and we were happy. Very happy. <laughs> <laughs> was to to do a steady shot, do a do the have the camera be still, and that was about aligning it by the sun, right? As the image we're seeing here, we were picturing the video to for the sun to always be steady, um, and we're the reason we're happy nobody listened or only half the people listened is it actually made it more dynamic. The two, we didn't realize that, but it made it more way more dynamic when the sun falls out of alignment and then realigns and you know moves all over the the place. Yeah. 
mean, that's pretty amazing. So there's actually 220 different images overlaid here. Yes. Um, yes. And then this, this was printed on a solar panel um, that had run its course. And um, this was another project we did in conjunction with uh, Little Sun. And so we made this image and then sold it at Art Basel in Switzerland. Um, and then all the funds were donated to people um, with energy needs. I think that's a, a, a pretty amazing uh, technical feat, if, if nothing else. But it's also, you know, to go back to the first works and these individual lottery tickets, the idea that, that this is the result of so many different people uh, looking at something and then, you know, sending it back to you, sort of mediated through individuals um, and then sort of turning it all into one. You know, I still like the, the idea of it being kind of aspirational. I mean, we are all on one very small, vulnerable planet, and many people are uh, sort of see no evil, hear no evil, uh, covering their eyes to it. Uh, but this is, um, you know, the idea of the setting sun. I think, Adam, you said when we first talked, like, it, it's uh, it's fatalistic. It's also optimistic. You know, it's, it's not the rising sun. Um, what was your thought on, on choosing the setting sun? You you really like to talk about this. Just <laughs> setting sun. The setting sun. I don't know. I think that, you know, forever the setting sun is this like magic moment and and we we are hypnotized by it. Um it's also, that, oh. also it's a lot easier to ask people to get the sun at six thirty, seven o'clock in the evening than <laughs> at 5 30 in the morning get up early and yeah, for art <laughs> get out of bed um it's but, the end of the day right it's your day is done yeah. it's it's this thing is over whenever something's over it's also the beginning of something right yeah so we've done a lot of different work about the beginning and the end and how do you see the difference between what's beginning and what's ending because mm -hmm. it all sort of rolls together it all informs the next thing oh and I think maybe on, on that note, we should uh, end our discussion and open the floor up to questions. That sounds great. Thank you so, so much for this incredibly generous conversation, Adam, Lauren, and Julie. That was such a pleasure to listen to. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. The first question will be from GE. GE, I'll give you the chance to unmute. Thank you very much, Chloe. Thank you, Julie, and, and thank you, Ghost of a Dream. I I keep thinking as I was as I as I think of the film, the film material and the alignment of the sun and everything, the way it's all working together, especially in the aggregations of the materials all coming together. I think of Taylor Deschardins' concept of the new sphere, you know, embodying the notion of sphere and mind. And the idea of growing towards an even greater integration, unification, is there anything to this? Yeah, I think for sure. I mean, I think that, especially with the Align by the Sun project, and I think with the DACA uh, work too, we were we were really thinking about like, how do we how do we sort of group ourselves all together, and how do we see that we're all connected somehow, you know, and that these decisions made elsewhere sometimes are affecting us all. Yeah, anything from you? No, well said. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, GE. Um, the next question and last question is going to be from Eleanor on the Brooklyn Rail team. Eleanor, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Chloe. And thank you so much, Julie and Ghosts of a Dream. That this has been really, really great. So, so fascinating. Um, I'm wondering if you could share some of your literary or scholarly um, inspirations and specifically in relation to the topic of environmentalism, if there are any scholars who you particularly turn to or, um, you know, who guide your work. I I don't know more than any like more than reading is probably the daily the New York Times <laughs> really it guides my life every day it wakes me yeah. up and starts my day um yeah but, I mean I I think that that I that we both like pour over newspapers more than anything yeah, else that's um, really 
and just unfortunately perhaps yeah. and maybe it's our time maybe it's having a family and building a studio and working in a studio and having side jobs but our most of anything i read currently is is news stories mm -hmm. do you have any suggestions <laughs> um i'm not sure if well, first of all, that I totally understand and that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's cool that your work is so, you know, rooted in the present. So I appreciate that. Um, I was thinking about Robin Wall Kimmerer, who wrote Braiding Sweetgrass. I'm not sure if you've heard of that book, but that's a really amazing book um about, you know, the environment and humans in the environment. So I, I would recommend that. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I was thinking. Um, since Julie, I bet Julie has a great answer for this, though, <laughs> as, as someone who teaches this in this subject. Uh, yeah, warning, my internet connection is suddenly they're telling me it's unstable and you all froze, but I, I, I right now I'm moving, so it must be okay. You, you look fine. Um, so certainly, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer is, is wonderful in their blending together. Uh, indigenous knowledge, and uh, she's a, also a biologist and thinking about um, essentially, you know, decentering humans. Uh, we're not just humans who are aligned by the sun, right? It's it's all. Earth. Oh. Like some other creatures, vibrating sweet grass. And I also, you know, I thought for your when I was thinking about your work, I was thinking about Rob Nixon's slow violence and the environmentalism of the poor. Because eroding violence that destroys and destroys uh, people's lands and often invisible and out of sight. He talks about the terrible uh, short attention man that we all have now. And he wrote in 2011, and I can tell you that it tends Bands have only gotten since then. But the points he makes are still really well taken. The mental disasters that impact local communities and that are the results of you know, countries like the United States just you know, throwing things away or you know, living in a certain way. Um, and I feel like that to me is what I thought of first when I looked at your work, these, you know, this bringing these things into focus, showing how ubiquitous they are. Uh, it, it's it getting us to imagine and understand that uh, this is the consequences of our actions. Any way that that can be achieved is really important. And uh, to the point where, uh, you know, at this point, slow violence has been the curatorial theme of a number of different exhibitions and courses on environmental art. Uh, the Tate did a short course on it. And I, I feel like that is something that, um, that I thought of when I looked at your work. So that would be something that, that I would I would recommend for further reading. Thank you. Thanks for that question, Eleanor. Um, well, I think that concludes our Q&A period today. Um, and Julie selected a poem to be read at the conclusion. I'm gonna read the poem, but I'm gonna give Julie a chance to speak to why this poem at the conclusion of today. Um, yeah, I, I was very sad when Flacco the Owl, uh, I read in the newspaper just a couple of weeks after we all celebrated his one year anniversary of freedom from the Central Park Zoo, um, that to read about his death likely by, uh, smashing into the, the window of a building, um, and the Times had a way where you could write in and you know, hundreds of people wrote in about what uh, Flacco had meant to them just you know, little things, proof that we weren't so far from the wild or that something could be in captivity and then still remember how to be wild. Um, there's a lot of hope. He inspired all kinds of things and I'm sure will ultimately inspire poetry. Um, but at the moment, the poem that I chose is a poem about a different owl written by Mary Oliver. But I like the poem because, as you'll hear, it kind of captures the the grandness of an owl uh, being an owl, and um, 
just its power as a, a beautiful apex predator. Um, so I thought that would be a nice way to uh, to close for today. So All right. Um, well, here we go. This is um, White Owl Flies Into and Out of the Field by Mary Oliver. Coming down out of the freezing sky with its depths of light, like an angel or a Buddha with wings, it was beautiful and accurate, striking the snow and whatever was there with a force that left the imprint of the tips of its wings five feet apart and the grabbing thrust of its feet and the indentation of what had been running through the white valleys of the snow. And then it rose gracefully and flew back to the frozen marshes to look to lurk there like a little lighthouse in the blue shadows. So I thought maybe death isn't darkness after all, but so much light wrapping itself around us as soft as feathers that we are instantly weary of looking and looking and shut our eyes, not without amazement, and let ourselves be carried as through the translucence of mica to the river that is without the least apple or shadow, that is nothing but light, scalding aortal light, in which we are washed and washed out of our bones. Thanks for choosing that, Julie. Um, thank you so much, Julie, and thank you, Adam and Lauren, for today's dialogue. Um, it was such a pleasure to listen to. Thank you to the team um, just who helped prepare for today's event. Um, that was It was just wonderful working with everyone, and thank you, Lauren and Adam, for putting all of those images together um, for us to look at today of your work. Um, we'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program and making daily conversations like this one possible. They also support our archive where you'll be able to watch this video later. Uh, and is, it's on YouTube. The rail has been free and independent for 23 years. A donation directly supports our work. Um, you can find the link to donate in the chat. And if you're free on Monday at 1 p.m., join us for a conversation on Americans in Paris, artists working in post-war France from 1946 to 1962, featuring Deborah bricker Balkin, Lynn Gumpert, and uh, hosted by our editor-at-large, Eleanor Hartney. Uh, and as now, it, as now, as is real tradition, I will um, allow you all to unmute yourselves and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Chloe, for the beautiful reading. It was wonderful. Thank Thank you. Lauren, thank you. Be well, everybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Adam and Lauren. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Julie. This was great.